Uh, today's lecture uh, will be about position sensors and uh, since this is a quite large topic uh, we will be discussing it uh, for the next uh, three lectures so uh, we will learn a lot about position sensors this is quite an important topic because uh, in many machines you need to measure position somehow uh, so let's take a look uh, on uh, uh, how can we divide uh, the position sensors based on uh, different properties? Uh, so first of all, the position sensor can measure angular or linear displacement. Uh, this is based on the principle of the sensor. And uh, some sensors, as we will see today, uh, will measure directly the angular po position and uh, some other sensors will measure linear displacement. Uh, of course, uh, between angular and linear displacement, you can transfer, you can change it with uh, gears and so on. Uh, but uh, in most cases, it is uh, better to choose directly the sensor that measures what you want. So if you want to measure angular position, then select the ang angular sensor and uh, if you want to measure linear position then you can select a sensor directly for linear position uh, if you use gears then you may have problems with uh, uh, the tolerances in the gears and so on so uh, for this reason it's better to choose directly the sensor that uh, corresponds to your measured property uh, some sensors, as we will see in the lectures, uh, will measure directly linear displacement. Some others will measure angular displacement and some principles will be uh, fine with both poss possibilities. So this is the first uh, category of sensors. Uh, then uh, the second uh, grouping uh, can be based on absolute or relative sensors. Uh, this means uh, what is the behavior of the sensor after you power it up. So imagine that you have the following application. You have, uh, let's say, an inkjet printer or a CNC mill and uh, you turn it on and you uh, need to measure what is the position of the axis. And in this case, uh, the typical use is uh, to use a relative sensor. Uh, a relative sensor, when you power it on does not know what is the correct position and uh, with a relative sensor you always need to go to a reference position so this reference position can be some end switch or you can manually zero some counter and say that this is my zero position and uh, the relative sensor counts uh, from this zero position and uh, if you lose power, you lose also this position. On the other hand, an absolute sensor can give you directly the correct position after you power the machine up. But uh, the price is that uh, the absolute sensor typically is much more expensive and uh, it is also less accurate. So. Uh, the, an example where you can use an absolute sensor is, uh, let's say, electric machine control. If you have uh, an electric uh, train or a tram or an electric car, then in order to control the motor properly, in order to control the torque and speed, uh, you need to know what is the actual rotor position. And uh, for this you require an absolute sensor. So we will see that uh, the absolute sensor gives us uh, directly the correct position after the power up, but uh, the resolution is typically lower. Uh, a rule of thumb for absolute and relative sensors is about factor of 10. So if uh, an absolute sensor has, let's say, 4000 position per some range, then uh, the relative sensor may easily have uh, something like hundred thousand positions per the same distance so uh, the relative sensor is typically much more accurate so it has smaller resolution uh, for the same price but uh, it requires uh, you to manually zero at the position 
So there are applications where you need to use an absolute sensor and there are applications where you need the accuracy and uh, in this case you need to use the relative sensor. Uh, so let me repeat this. The absolute sensor gives you correct position after power up. A relative sensor requires you to go to some zero position. Uh, the third grouping uh, on the, this position sensors can be analog or digital sensors. And this does not apply to the output signal of the sensor. Uh, even if the sensor is digital, it may have an analog output signal, although this is not very common, but it's possible. But uh, this grouping is based on the principle of the sensor. So as we will see, some sensors will have essentially an infinite resolution and uh, hence we'll call them analog sensors and uh, some sensors in principle will have uh, a finite resolution and we will call them digital. Uh, all sensors that you will see today will be analog sensors and all sensors that you will see today will also be absolute sensors. Uh, the next grouping can be continuous or proximity sensors. Uh, the difference is in uh, the way the sensor works and uh, in the way you have the output signal available. A continuous sensor gives you directly the distance between the sensor and the object. So let's say you have an access of a CNC machine you have a continuous sensor mounted on the axis. So this sensor can give you a continuous reading of the position. It can tell you that now you have a position of um, 25 millimeters and now you have 28 millimeters, for example. Uh, so it gives you a continuous information. The output signal of a continuous sensor is uh, a continuous signal so it can be a current it can be voltage it can be some digital bus but anyway it's uh, giving you the distance on the other hand the proximity sensor can only detect the presence of the object and it will not tell you how far the object is so as uh, the object is within the detection distance then it gets detected you know that your object is there but you don't know how far it is. A typical use of proximity sensor is, uh, for example, on uh, assembly lines or on packaging lines. You have a conveyor belt, you have a product on the conveyor belt, and uh, you want to detect that the product is on the conveyor belt so that you can grab it and pack it with, uh, with some arm or with some, with some machine, for example. So in this case, you just need to know the object is there or the object is not there. You don't need to know precisely how far the object is from the sensor. So a proximity sensor gives you a digital signal on the output. It's a 1 or 0, yes or no, high or low. And uh, it gives you an info that the object is there or the object is not there. Uh, all the sensors that we will see today will be continuous sensors. We will discuss proximity sensors in, in one week or in two weeks. Uh, the advantage of proximity sensors is uh, price, because uh, in many applications you really don't need to have the info about the distance. You just need to know that uh, the object is present. And uh, the proximity sensor may be something like 100 US dollars, approximately maybe 50 US dollars. Uh, and the continuous sensor will be something like um, 200 or 300 US dollars. So uh, uh, it is more expensive to use a continuous sensor. And as I said, there are many applications where you just need to know that the object is there. So in this case, you will need to use a proximity sensor. All the sensors that we will see uh, will exploit different uh, physical properties. Uh, it may be the change of electrical resistance, it may be change of inductance, capacitance, uh, magnetic properties and so on. And uh, today we will see the change of resistance and then we will see the change of inductance. 
and uh, the other properties uh, we will discuss uh, in the next lectures. So remember that all the sensors that we will see today will be absolute sensors, they will be analog sensors and they will be continuous sensors. Now let's take a look on the first sensor which will be a resistive sensor. A resistive sensor is uh, nothing else than a variable resistor and uh, you are detecting the changes of electrical resistance. So the sensor is here. This is my variable resistor. This represents uh, the uh, sensor itself. And uh, here the output voltage V2 will be a function of the position. The position that I want to measure, let's call it X. This is that's shown here. And uh, the object that we are looking for is uh, connected to the slider. So the slider here is mechanically connected to our object. It can be either spring-loaded or uh, you can have a, a screw and a thread in your object. In a way there is a direct mechanical connection. And uh, here the slider is moving with the object. So the position X is changing. And uh, therefore this slider in my picture is moving up and down. And as this happens, uh, we are changing the values of resistor R1 and resistor R2. So R2 is uh, the part of this resistance that is below the slider over there. And R1 is the part of the resistance that is above the slider over here. And uh, the total resistance of this sensor, let's call it R0. And uh, R0 is R1 plus R2. Uh, typically, uh, we are not evaluating directly the change of electrical resistance, but uh, we measure the voltage because it's easier to measure voltage than to have a sensor for resistance. So uh, we do not measure, for example, R2 directly, but uh, we measure the voltage that we have on the output V2. Uh, in order to make it work, we need a power supply. And uh, this power supply is uh, the voltage shown here on the left. Uh, we'll use the symbol V. And uh, it's typically some low voltage, some DC voltage, uh, something like 5 volts, maybe 12 volts. Uh, not, not much larger. And uh, this uh, DC voltage is powering uh, this sensor. So there is some current flowing in this circuit and uh, here we have some output voltage V2. Uh, the load here shown as RL, this represents the voltmeter. So uh, here this uh, could be the internal resistance of the voltmeter. Uh, if it's an analog voltmeter it can be fairly low, it could be a few kilo ohms, it could be a few hundreds of kilo ohms. If it is uh, a digital voltmeter it can be larger it can be something like 10 mega ohms. That's uh, the typical uh, input resistance of a digital voltmeter. So this load represents the, the gauge where we see the number. Uh, it could be also a computer system, but also in this case, it has uh, some input resistance. So now let's analyze this circuit and now let's see uh, how can we actually calculate uh, the function that describes the voltage V2 that we have here. Uh, if you uh, have had some classes uh, on uh, electronics, then uh, you should be able to analyze this circuit. And uh, this circuit is nothing else than a voltage divider. So here we have the input voltage V and uh, the voltage V2 is uh, a division of uh, the input voltage and the, the division ratio is uh, given by the resistance that we have in the circuit. And uh, since this is a voltage divider, here uh, the voltage V2 will be equal to V that we have on the power supply uh, times uh, the parallel combination of uh, RL and R2. So it's this resistor. At where we actually measure the voltage V2. So this is R2 in parallel to RL. And uh, in the formula, this is this uh, part of the equation. 
So this is uh, the parallel combination of RL and R2. And uh, the, it, this is divided by the sum of this parallel combination plus R1. So that's here uh, in this formula, we have R1, that's the part of the resistance. And this again is the parallel combination. So uh, this is the equation that describes the voltage uh, on V2. Uh, we can further simplify it. And uh, we see that uh, the output voltage V2 depends on the power supply voltage. So it needs to be quite stable. Uh, it depends uh, on the value of R2. And uh, since R2 and R1, they both depend on the position X. That's what we actually want. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we see that it also depends on the value of RL. So it depends also on the value of the load. Uh, in other words, uh, if uh, we have the same position and uh, if we change the load resistance, for example, by using uh, a different voltmeter, uh, we will see also a different uh, output voltage. So uh, there is a, a relation between the output voltage, position, and also uh, on the load uh, that we have here to the circuit. Uh, we can further simplify this equation because right now we see that uh, we have R2 and R1 in the equation, but uh, we know that uh, they both depend on the position X. So uh, I would like to simplify it further so that we have a function where V2 is a function of X and eventually something else, but uh, that we don't have two parameters such as R1 and R2 in the equation. Uh, in order to do, to do this, uh, we will uh, make the following assumptions. Uh, first, uh, we will define that R2 is uh, R position X times R0. R0 is uh, the initial resistance of the sensor here between those two fixed terminals. Now, typically it is a value of few kiloohms, so let's say two kiloohms, five kiloohms, something in this range. And uh, we will define that it's x times r0. So uh, if, for example, x is all the way down here, I will say that uh, this equals to x0, so this position will be 0, and uh, therefore r2 will be 0 as well. And uh, r1 is uh, R0 minus R2. So uh, we can see that it's uh, 1 minus X times R0. Uh, so here uh, the position in my picture is defined that X0 corresponds to this bottom position and X1 corresponds to this position. Uh, we will assume that the position X is moving from 0 to 1. So from minimal to maximal position. And the second uh, assumption will be that uh, we will hide the uh, resistance RL that we have here, the load resistance, into a value that we will call K. And uh, this value K will tell us what is the ratio between the load resistance to the initial sensor resistance. So for example, if here I have a voltmeter with RL that's, uh, let's say, 10 kilo ohms, and uh, R0 would be 1, then the value of K uh, will be 10. If uh, here is 10 kilo ohms and here we have 10 kilo ohms, then value of K will be equal to 1. And we will see that uh, with the help of the K value, uh, we are able to say in advance what will be the behavior of the sensor because uh, we will see that uh, if we have a large value of K then uh, for this large value of K the influence of the load resistance here on V2 will be getting smaller and uh, the ideal value of K will go to infinity. So in the ideal case uh, we should have the resistance RL here as high as possible. Uh, we will see this uh, mathematically in a minute. So now let's use uh, this equation, this equation and this equation in the previous formula. And uh, we see uh, what is the resulting equation. 
Uh, it's a very complicated equation that uh, probably no one can remember. And uh, I show it here only uh, with the resulting uh, equation. And uh, again, this is not a formula to remember, but uh, here I would like to stress out that uh, this is a nonlinear equation. So if we are changing the position x uh, linearly, then uh, the output uh, voltage V2 will not change in a linear way. We see that here we have x here, we have x squared here, uh, so it will not be a linear equation. Uh, we can see that uh, the voltage still depends on the value of k, uh, but we'll see on the next slide that uh, if we are increasing the value of k, it's getting more and more linear. So here, this is uh, the nonlinear equation that applies, but if uh, the value of k is high enough, let's say higher than 100, then uh, the formula will be fairly linear and we'll get a fairly linear uh, response of the sensor. Uh, so let's uh, see uh, for what value of k this will actually apply. So uh, we have this equation that describes the sensor output voltage. Uh, we see that it's still a function of the input voltage. That's, uh, we can't remove that actually. But uh, now let's take a look on the value of k. Uh, if you calculate a limit of this equation for uh, k going to infinity, uh, then you will find out that this, this will give you actually a linear equation. So uh, if uh, by some circuit connection I'm able to make a very high value of k, then uh, I have a, a linear equation. So here, uh, how this is achieved? Well, it's achieved uh, in such a way that uh, we take a voltmeter with a very high internal resistance. So, uh, for example, if my value of R0, the, the sensor resistance, is something like 5 kilo ohms, then uh, I should take uh, the voltmeter, which has uh, at least uh, 500 kilo ohms. So, it's about uh, at least 100 times larger than uh, the resistance of the sensor. Uh, and in this way, uh, we can uh, be fairly sure that here, the voltage V2 is uh, almost linear uh, as a function of uh, x. Uh, the way it's typically done uh, is that uh, here this voltmeter is a digital voltmeter and uh, that uh, the digital voltmeters today have a fairly high input resistance. It could be easily 10 mega ohms. Uh, so uh, we have a fairly large value of uh, the ratio k here that we have. Uh, so uh, a high value of k means that uh, we are using a high load resistance. And uh, this is the case of uh, the digital voltmeters. The usual input resistance is 10 mega ohms, although it may be much higher if, uh, if you, re you really did need it to. Uh, analog voltmeters, on the other hand, have uh, a much smaller resistance. And uh, moreover, for analog voltmeters, uh, the input resistance depends on uh, the range. So if you are changing the range, uh, this uh, input resistance RL will change as well. So uh, if you decrease the range, then it will decrease the resistance as well. So, uh, if you remember the very first lecture, when I explained uh, how to use an analog voltmeter, I told you that uh, it's important to use it with a maximum deflection and uh, uh, to change the range in such a way that you have a maximum deflection. But uh, with the resistive sensor, th this does not apply. Because uh, here, when you are changing the range of the voltage on the voltmeter, on an analog voltmeter, you are changing the value of uh, input resistance as well. And uh, since uh, this would change the value of V2, uh, you would get a uh, different value of voltage for the same position. So uh, this shouldn't be done uh, with this kind of uh, experiment. 
uh, let's take a look uh, on the difference uh, that uh, we create if uh, the value is of k is uh, not infinite. Uh, so we can uh, calculate the relative error and uh, we know that the relative error is uh, the difference between the actual voltage and uh, the correct voltage. Here we can uh, easily say what is the correct voltage. Uh, we will assume that the correct voltage is given by this formula. So since this formula is a linear equation, it is uh, applying for k going to infinity. So let's use this as the correct voltage. And we'll use this in the calculation of the relative error. So the relative error here, this is my voltage that I actually measure for some value of k. And uh, this uh, is uh, the correct voltage for k going to infinity. And uh, we will calculate that in percent. So uh, that's why here we multiply that by 100. Uh, if we further simplify the equation, uh, we will find out that it's this formula. And there are two uh, interesting uh, points. Uh, one is that uh, the relative error here is always negative. Here we have this negative sign. And uh, this means that uh, in the real experiment, the voltage that we measure will be always smaller than the correct voltage. So if our value of k is not infinite, then our voltage will be always small. Uh, the second point is if uh, you, you substitute different values of k here in this, uh, in this uh, formula, and uh, if I substitute here infinity, where k is going to infinity, then uh, I divide something by infinity, which is zero. So the relative error is zero when k is going to infinity and uh, this happens uh, when you have an unloaded uh, circuit so when the load resistance is going to infinity as well so from this analysis we can see that if we are increasing the value of rl uh, we are actually decreasing this relative error and for this reason here uh, we are back at the infinite value so this is why uh, the ideal value of k is going in to infinity. Uh, when this is infinite, it means that here there is no resistance here. This is infinite. And here we have the voltage V2. And uh, we don't need to take care about linearity because here then uh, this uh, formula applies and it's a linear equation. So uh, if we take a digital voltmeter with a very high input resistance, it will say 10 mega ohms. Uh, then uh, it is uh, better than a voltmeter which has uh, 10 kilo ohms, for example. Uh, we can do a very similar analysis also uh, with relation to position. We can see here that uh, the relative error, here we have the x in the formula, and uh, this tells us that the relative position, relative error, uh, will be also dependent on position. So there will be definitely some maximum relative error and this will correspond to some position. Uh, we can do the same analysis also for an absolute error. So let's do it and let's uh, find out uh, where the maximum is actually positioned. Uh, if you have a formula, you know this from mathematics and uh, if you want to calculate the position where you have the maximum of some function, uh, you take this function and you calculate the partial derivative and uh, you set it to zero. So this is our function. This is our function that describes the relative error. And now I will take this function and uh, I will make a partial derivative of this over x and I will set it to zero. And from this I will get that x equals to 0.5. So we can see that regardless of the value of k, the maximum relative error is always in the middle of the position. So it is telling us that uh, we have uh, a specified position where the maximum error 
will be will be placed always. Uh, a very similar analysis can be done also for an absolute error. Uh, so this is the formula for the absolute error. Uh, we again can calculate the partial derivative of it over x and uh, put it equal to zero. And uh, from this, uh, we can see that uh, for k equal to one, uh, the position is approximately 0.7. Uh, here, if you do this analysis, uh, you will find out that it actually depends on the value of k. So you will not get rid of this k that you have in the formula. But uh, there is the dependence is uh, only very slightly dependent on k. So uh, we will analyze it for the worst case scenario that uh, is uh, the value of k equal to 1. Uh, for other values of k, this uh, position x is slightly shifting towards uh, higher values, but it's uh, only a very slight shift, so it's something like, if this is for k, it's 0 0.69, then it might be something like 0 0.7, 0 0.71, and so on. So there is a very slightly dependent on, on the value of k. Uh, now let's put, plot that in the chart. And uh, let's see uh, how does it look like. So in this chart, we see the output voltage and errors uh, on uh, the position sensor as a function of position. Now know that the position here is uh, shown from 0 to 1. So from minimal value to maximum value. So this applies to any resistive sensor. And uh, here, uh, this is shown as a ratio between V and V, uh, V2 and V1. Uh, and this is a ratio between the output voltage to the input voltage. So uh, again, this applies to any sensor. So uh, the voltage here is shown again from zero to one. So from minimal to maximum voltage that we actually have available. Uh, the blue line here is uh, the linear dependence shown for k going to infinity. So uh, this is the case, uh, the ideal case, where we have a really high or infinite high uh, input resistance of the voltmeter. And we see that uh, here this is uh, a linear dependence. So this blue line is uh, nothing else uh, than this equation. Uh, the next uh, will be this formula here shown as a function of uh, of k and uh, for different positions and uh, in the chart here this is this magenta curve that we have here and uh, in my example I have chosen the value of k going to 1 so here in this case k going to 1 you can see that uh, here we have a difference between the correct voltage and between the voltage that we actually measure. Um, let me remind that uh, the value of K equal to 1 means uh, that uh, we have the same resistance on the load as uh, the resistance R0 on uh, the sensor. So we can see that uh, here uh, when we have zero position we have zero voltage and here we have zero error as well. So here we measure the correct value. And uh, the same happens here at the end. So at the maximum position, uh, we measure the same voltage uh, with our sensor with K1 and with K infinity. So we have zero relative and absolute error here at this point, And we have zero relative error here at this point. Uh, as we are getting closer to the middle here, somewhere this position, uh, this is where we have the maximum relative error and this is here shown with this red curve and uh, this is the point that we have calculated on the previous slide. So this is the position that uh, corresponds to the maximum relative error. So at this position we actually have the maximum relative error. How We see that how much that is. Uh, we could actually uh, calculate the, the value uh, and uh, we could find out uh, what is the relative error for this uh, kind of sensor. This would be done here by using uh, this 
formula. So here we would substitute 0 0.5, here we would substitute k, and this will get us uh, the value for in, in percent for the relative error of this position sensor. Uh, the absolute error we can see has a little bit different shape uh, but uh, again here there is a maximum value around 0 0.7 and uh, then the uh, absolute error is getting then smaller and smaller and here at position 1 uh, we have uh, zero relative error and uh, zero absolute error and again this is uh, shown that the absolute error is shown for k equal to 1 uh, if uh, it will be for different value of k, then uh, this maximum point, this maximum absolute error, will shift slightly to the right here. But uh, you can see here that the curve is is quite flat, so uh, the shift is not very significant. It it stays always here uh, at z around 0 0.7, so we can say that it's around two thirds of uh, the range uh, that we are actually using. Uh, now let's take a look on uh, uh, what materials are used uh, in uh, resistive sensors. So uh, there are basically few components in a resistive sensor and uh, one of them is uh, the resistive track material. So a slider is moving on this resistive track material and uh, this resistive track can be made from different materials. Uh, one uh, possibility is that you make it like a wire. So this is then called a wire wound resistor. So we take a wire that has a specific resistance, uh, you make a coil of it, you remove the insulation and uh, you have a vi variable resistor basically. Uh, compared to the other possibilities that we'll discuss in a second, uh, this has a little bit lower resolution although it's uh, still very good. It typically is uh, something like 0.1% of uh, full scale. So it's a fairly good resolution still. Uh, the wire wound resistors are quite robust. So uh, they are prone to mechanical damage. Uh, they can be work in environments where you have vibrations and so on. So some uh, industrial sensors are based on this. Uh, the second possibility is that uh, you create the resistive track with a metallized layer. So you take uh, basic material, ceramics or let's say some plastic material, you deposit a metallized layer on that and this is then used as the resistive track. Uh, compared to wire bound, uh, this has a higher resolution. Uh, basically it's an uh, in infinite resolution because the layer does not have any uh, any limitations with this, re with this respect uh, but uh, it's limited by material non-uniformity it is limited by noise uh, and uh, of course uh, this layer can be damaged uh, by wear or friction it can be damaged by heating so uh, it is uh, a little bit less resistant and less robust uh, than the wire bound sensor. Uh, very similar uh, is uh, a carbon resistor. So uh, the layer can be made from carbon, but uh, carbon, unless it's a diamond, it's a diamond. So if it's a normal carbon, then it's a very soft material, and uh, it is very prone to wear. So uh, it can be easily damaged uh, by uh, pressure, it can be damaged by vibrations. Uh, resistors uh, are really produced with carbon layers, but uh, those are really the cheapest resistors. So if you buy a variable resistor with a carbon layer, it will be maybe good for an audio amplifier control if you want to control the, the, the speakers. Uh, but uh, it will not last very long. So the layer will be damaged and uh, uh, you need to replace this uh, layer or this, this uh, variable resistor entirely. So carbon resistors are not used in industrial systems. They are used in really, really low cost applications such as the audio amplifiers. If you buy an amplifier for a few 
a uh, few, do few dollars, then it may have those variable resistors. Uh, industrial systems need to have some uh, robustness against vibrations and this is where conductive plastic and uh, ceramic materials come in place. A conductive plastic uh, it's very similar to all the other layers except that this is a plastic that has been made conductive uh, with uh, typically again carbon particles and uh, I will show you in, in a few minutes some examples of those sensors. So many industrial sensors today they are using the conductive plastic and uh, many industrial sensors are also using the CERMET material. A CERMET is a composite material made from metal and ceramics. So CER stands for ceramics and MET stands for metal. And uh, the advantage of this material is that um, it has high temperature resistance. It is hard but uh, at the same time it allows small plastic deformations so it's an ideal material for variable resistors so uh, one of the best uh, materials used for variable resistor is cermet and you may find it also in a normal variable resistors not not only sensors but uh, ordinary variable resistors as well uh, the linearity that you can expect uh, is um, between 0.05 and 0.1%. Uh, if you have a round resistor with larger diameters, it may be even smaller. So uh, with a larger sensor, uh, you will get uh, better linearity. Uh, let's take a look on uh, some examples of uh, linear positional sensors. Uh, those ones uh, they are using conductive plastics and uh, we can see approximately what the accuracies uh, we can achieve and uh, what ranges so uh, with this specific type that we actually are using in the lab uh, you can get a range between 25 millimeters to about one meter or well, it depends on the type so you, you may find sensors with smaller range and, and larger range as well uh, they have a high accuracy, you can see here the, the numbers. Uh, they say essentially infinite resolution, yes that's true because the, the layer itself does not have any limitation compared to the wire wound sensors for example. But then uh, the, your resolution is uh, limited by the resolution of the voltmeter. So uh, if you are using a voltmeter which has uh, let's say 16-bit analog to digital converter then this will limit you the resolution uh, we can see uh, approximately the, the size here or the dimensions so uh, length and uh, thickness uh, the length obviously depends uh, on uh, the length uh, plus something so uh, on the length that you want so uh, in our labs uh, the length that we have is about 30 centimeters uh, that's 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 the range that we measure. Uh, the range here applies for the whole series of those uh, of those resistors. So uh, you you may get uh, them in different uh, sizes and different ranges as well. Uh, uh, how does it work? Uh, this uh, is the resistor itself, and uh, it is fixed to a frame of your machine. So here you can see this clamps. They they clamp it to the frame of the machine and uh, this is the slider and uh, this is a threaded rod and here we have two nuts uh, and you use those two nuts to connect it to the to the movable part of the machine so uh, this is connected to the frame this is connected to the movable part to the axis for example and then this is moving like this and uh, you change the, the position and you measure the voltage on the output. Uh, for all, uh, well, this is uh, this is the, an example of the linear conductive track. So here you can see how the, it looks like. So this is the conductive track. This is the conductive plastic layer, and here we can see those uh, three terminals are the, the actually the terminals of the resistor, so that uh, we can uh, measure the the resistance variation as function of position. And then uh, there is the slider, it's not shown here in this picture, but it's moving 
uh, along this track like this and uh, it uh, is connecting those two tracks together and uh, we measure the changes of electrical resistance. Uh, for resistive sensors it is uh, important to use a power supply voltage that's not too high and uh, by not too high I mean something like uh, 12 volts, 15 volts, maybe up to 30 volts. So here is a second example, a different company but uh, let's say very similar style of the resistor. Mm, here we can see the maximum voltage, 30 volts in this case, that's like a normal value. Uh, we can see also that uh, they give us a maximum current, so uh, we cannot uh, use uh, a higher current than allowed here. This is due to self-heating. And uh, here we can see also that uh, uh, it's made in such a way that it has a very small internal capacitance and internal inductance, so almost zero. Well, of course, there will always be some capacitance and inductance but uh, it's uh, very small. Uh, anyway, we are using DC voltage, so uh, we do not care too much about inductivity and capacity in our circuit. So again here, this is uh, connected to the movable part of your machine, so it can be an axis of a CNC, for example, uh, and this is uh, connected to the frame. Uh, many of those sensors look in a similar fashion. Uh, we can see the application, so injection molding machines, uh, printing presses, uh, woodworking machines, cranes, scales, and so on and so on. So uh, anywhere we want to uh, measure the position of something. And uh, this is a continuous sensor, so it will give us uh, a continuous information about the position. The output signal is proportional to the position that we have. Uh, and it works in a very similar way also if you make it a rotary sensor. So if it's a rotary encoder then it looks like this. Uh, the ro resistive track is uh, a circle like this. So it can be a circle or it can be a spiral if it's a multi-turn resistor. And uh, then this gives you directly the angular position. So uh, then uh, this shaft that you see over there is connected to your movable part which can be a ball screw it could be it could be some some handle for example and uh, then this box is connected to a frame and here you see those terminals um, we see only two of them but there needs to be three and uh, th those three terminals are connected to the circuit and we use the output voltage as an info about the angle of the shaft that we have here uh, this is a single turn wire wound, so uh, there is a coil of wire that is oriented like this and the slider is uh, moving along this, uh, along this uh, coil of wire. Uh, you can also find uh, multi-turn resistors, uh, they typically have something like uh, bet between, let's say, 2 and 15 turns. And in this case, uh, it is a thin layer of a metallized material and uh, it's typically in a spiral. So uh, this uh, slider then moves up and down with, in a spiral like this and uh, you have a possibility to measure the, the angular resolution. So those sensors are used uh, in applications where uh, you have um, to measure angular position. Uh, to give you an example, if uh, you have ever played with uh, RC hobby planes, then uh, inside of a model servos uh, there is a feedback system and uh, this feedback measures actually the position and uh, this is uh, an example how it's done. So uh, typically there is a single turn uh, resistor, variable resistor, it's used as a position sensor and it measures uh, the angle of uh, the shaft of the servo. So that's uh, where you may, may, may find it in uh, some non-industrial application. So that's all about resistive sensors and uh, let's take a look on the second group uh, which will be the 
inductive sensor. Uh, an inductive sensor obviously will use uh, the inductivity change as a function of uh, the position. So uh, I will show you only one example today of the inductive sensor and uh, uh, we'll see in next week or in two weeks uh, another example of uh, this inductive sensor. Uh, the one sensor that I will show you is called an LVDT. An LVDT uh, stands for Linear Variable Differential Transformer. Uh, so uh, this is the, here you see the letters, uh, what is the meaning of those letters in this, uh, in this uh, name. Uh, typically when you are looking for it, you will just find LVDT in catalogs and so on. So now let's take a look uh, on how this uh, sensor works. Uh, here uh, we have uh, a core and uh, this core is actually mechanically connected to the object where we measure the position. So here this position X is that, that what I want to measure. Uh, it's a transformer. So in a transformer we need uh, several windings. So here the winding L1 is the primary winding. And uh, here we have L21 and L22, uh, and those will be the secondary windings. So an LVDT has at least three windings. We need a power supply, and uh, since this is a transformer, it needs to be AC powered. So here this is an AC power supply. It supplies AC voltage and AC current. And uh, this resistor R1 uh, represents the wire resistance in a circuit. So it represents the uh, resistivity of uh, the sensor of, the, of this uh, primary winding. So here L1 represents the ideal inductance uh, that we have in the transformer. And this represents the resistance. In reality, it's not there. In reality, the AC voltage is directly connected to the coil. And uh, this is L R1 is like a model uh, to help us with the circuit description. Uh, the same is uh, on the secondary side. We have L21 and L22. And we have the associated uh, resistances here. Now, uh, I have assumed that uh, the resistances and the secondary winding in the is, are the same. So for this reason here I have R2 and R2 as well. Uh, typically it's the case because uh, those two windings on the secondary side, they are, they are identical. So uh, they have the same inductance here and the same inductance here and same resistance uh, that, uh, in the circuit. Now the output voltage here we can see that uh, those two windings are actually connected in series but uh, they are not connected directly in series but uh, here we can see that this terminal goes to the winding and then this terminal goes to the other side of the winding so uh, if for example here we will have uh, plus voltage and here we will have negative voltage it will uh, subtract and the output voltage will be zero uh, since we are actually in AC circuit, uh, we will need to consider this as instantaneous values of the voltage. So here the output voltage uh, will be some function of the position. Uh, now uh, let's see how this works. Uh, let's imagine that initially uh, the core here is aligned in the middle. So here uh, the core is aligned and uh, uh, the magnetic flux in the transformer flows uh, partially uh, through this primary winding into this secondary winding. So here we have some induced voltage and uh, here we have some induced voltage as well. Since the core is aligned in the middle, then those two voltages will be the same. So here we will have some voltage and here we'll have the same voltage. Uh, we're in AC circuit and uh, we need to take into account also the phase of the voltage. You can note here that uh, 
this terminal is connected to that terminal and not to this terminal. And this means that uh, if I have the same voltage here and same voltage there, uh, and together with the mechanical alignment here, uh, it means that uh, the two voltages will have the same amplitude but will have a different phase. So there will be a 180 degrees phase shift between this voltage and this voltage. And uh, if you sum those voltages together, it will give you zero. So uh, when the core is aligned in the middle, then here uh, we will have zero output voltage. As soon as we start to move the core upwards here, so let's say it will be now aligned here, then we'll have some voltage in this core and a very small voltage uh, in this secondary winding. So in, the, in here, we'll have a small voltage here, we'll, we'll have a larger voltage. So we'll see some voltage V2. The same will happen also when uh, we move the core down, so when it will be aligned somewhere here, then this will give us a higher voltage than this secondary winding. So again, we'll see some voltage here, V2, as uh, we move the core downwards. Uh, if you plot this in a chart, then the typical shape of V2 as a function of x is looking like this. So it's a V-shaped curve. And here, in this region, uh, we are somewhere around here, so the core is aligned uh, with this uh, bottom winding, and uh, there is a fairly linear dependence uh, of the voltage on position. So if I'm here, I'm somewhere around this region. Uh, if uh, I move it upwards here, I am again in the linear region, but uh, here, now I'm he in, in here, in, the, in this chart, uh, you can also note that uh, just by looking on the amplitude of the voltage, if I use, use just a voltmeter here, I cannot tell if I am at this position or if I am at that position. So if I measure only the voltage like this, I cannot tell if I am here or if I am there. So we'll need to measure also the phase shift of the voltage. We'll see that uh, in a minute on the next slide. And uh, here, uh, when the core is centered, so when it's like this, as shown in the picture, in this position, uh, we should have zero voltage in the ideal case. But uh, in reality, we have uh, some non-zero voltage, but a quite small voltage. So this, this value uh, is typically a few millivolts. Uh, the reason for this is uh, called stray magnetic flux it means that uh, the magnetic flux is not closed entirely just uh, through the core, but uh, it flows also in the air. So even though it's perfectly aligned, we have some small magnetic flux that is inducing the voltage here in the winding. So this is uh, the tip of this letter. It's not sharp, it's not like this, but there is a small value, a few millivolts here in this range. And then we see that we, here we have flat area in here and, and flat area in there. And this flat area means that uh, the core is far away from the windings. So it's, uh, for example, all the way here. And even then, if I move the core, I don't have any info about the position because uh, if the core is completely outside of the transformer, it will not influence uh, the output voltage. So here is the flat area and here is the flat area. One corresponds to the position all the way to the bottom and one corresponds to the position that is all the way on the top. So this is the typical V-shape uh, that uh, you see as an output from an LVDT. Uh, now obviously uh, we could use this uh, very easily if we take a voltmeter and uh, if we want to, to use it only from zero to some position here, then it's fine with uh, just a voltmeter. But uh, typically we uh, want to use it in the whole range, so here and here as well. So we need to combine this curve into a single curve 
and uh, we need to have some more info related if we are at this range or if we are at this range. And the way this is done is that uh, we measure not only the voltage, like the magnitude of the voltage, but uh, we measure also the phase shift between the voltage. So this is again the V shape of the curve. You can see again that the zero position does not give you zero voltage. So if you take directly the voltmeter, then this is the V shape curve that you will get. And uh, this uh, second curve is uh, the phase shift between the voltage. We can see that uh, if we are in this area, then we have some phase shift. In this case, it's positive. That's the phase shift between uh, the primary winding here between the primary voltage and one of the secondary voltages and uh, as we are moving downwards or upwards uh, then uh, the phase shift will change to a negative value here it's not important to get the exact values we see that here it's a constant here it's a constant as well uh, we are only looking for this transition and we see that uh, if the phase shift here is positive then we are at this half of the of the range if uh, the phase shift here is uh, negative then we are at this half of the of the range so uh, we can combine those two charts together and uh, we can create a nice output of the sensor uh, so here uh, this is a linear range uh, that corresponds to this region and here this linear range corresponds to that region uh, typically, we can see here that the new position uh, we add, we add uh, a slight offset so that uh, for zero position we have uh, a zero output voltage. So then uh, the electronics that is actually embedded in the sensor uh, measures the magnitude of the voltage, measures the phase shift of the voltage and then uh, creates this nice linear output that uh, corresponds to the position. So this gives us uh, the linear voltage output on, of the full range. So we can see minus 100%, plus 100%. And typically there is a fairly linear response of this sensor. Now let's take a look what is inside. Uh, inside uh, we have the windings and uh, we have the core. So the core, that's the only component that is uh, connected uh, to the object where you measure. Again, an LVDT is a continuous sensor, so it gives you a continuous reading. Uh, we can see here the primary winding. The primary winding runs along the whole length of the sensor. So if uh, your sensor should have a range of, let's say, 100 millimeters, then uh, this needs to be 100 millimeters as well. If it should be something like one meter, then it has to be one meter and uh, we have two secondary windings and one secondary winding is in one half of the sensor and the second the secondary winding is uh, here at the other half of the sensor uh, here we can see how it's done so those uh, circles represent the wires that we have in the winding so this is a coil of the primary winding this is a coil of secondary winding and again this is a coil of secondary winding as well. Uh, in order to make it work, uh, the materials that uh, we have uh, in the sensor need to be ferromagnetic. So here we have a steel housing, it's this ferromagnetic material, and uh, this uh, core needs to be ferromagnetic as well. So it's uh, also made from iron or from some steel that is magnetic. And as the core is moving, it changes the mutual inductivity between the primary winding and the secondary windings. And that's uh, how it uh, gets us the output voltage. Uh, here we can see the terminals. So six wires, uh, two wires go to the primary winding, two wires and two wires go to the secondary windings. Uh, typically there is, a, there is a threaded hole uh, where uh, you can actually connect your object so you use a thread to connect it or uh, it is spring loaded so in some cases there is a spring in the sensor and uh, it loads uh, the it loads some force against your object so uh, you 
are always in touch with your objects. Uh, here are a few examples how this sensor looks like. Uh, the advantage of uh, an LVDT is, is that it's very robust. There is a single movable part and that's the core itself. Uh, so uh, it can apply low friction, but you can you can have some Teflon coating, for example. So there can be low friction between the core and uh, the sensor. Uh, it can allow high precision. Uh, an LVDT can typically measure within a few micrometers, so uh, you can uh, you can measure very accurately. Uh, there are links uh, to some videos how to select an LVDT and how it's done, so I recommend you to take a look on that. Uh, here are a few examples how those LVDTs look like. So this is the, the core, this is attached then to your object. So in this case, we can see it's again a thread here, and here we have two knots until you attach this uh, end to the movable part, and this is uh, the sensor itself and this is attached to the frame so in all cases uh, this is attached always to the frame as we can see here uh, in some cases such as this one or this one or, or those ones in general uh, those are spring loaded so there is a spring inside and uh, this tip of the sensor then pushes against your object so then this is your object and as your object is moving uh, this uh, spring loads uh, the force to the object and uh, you can measure the object position. Now what you can see on those pictures uh, that those are sensors for different ranges. So uh, you can get an LVDT with a range of for example one millimeter and then it would look somehow like this. So this is a very small LVDT. Uh, it will have a very small range but uh, will be very accurate or you can get an LVDT that looks like this and uh, in this case it would have um, say 10 centimeters maybe 20 centimeters measurement range so this will go all the way out and uh, you can measure the position it at any point uh, obviously with higher ranges uh, you will have lower resolution so it's a trade-off between range and resolution. Uh, typically LVDTs have an embedded electronic circuit so you do not measure directly the voltages uh, from the windings but uh, typically at this end over there uh, near the connection cable uh, there is an embedded electronic circuit that uh, gives you the output and the output uh, can be voltage, uh, it can be a 4 to 20 milliampere current signal or it could be some digital bus. But typically it's a, it's a current signal. Uh, let's take a look on uh, two example applications where LVDTs are used. Uh, in general, LVDTs are very robust sensors. So uh, they can work in environments where you have vibrations, uh, they can work in environments where you have uh, temperature changes and so on. So uh, one example where uh, an LVDT is used, he, it's shown here on the picture, is an aircraft thrust reverser actuator. A thrust reverser is uh, a device in an airplane that helps it to brake uh, uh, by using the power of the, of the turbines. So it reverses the airflow uh, against the, the motion direction. And uh, since this requires measurements, then uh, they are using LVDTs. Uh, the second uh, example is uh, if you are uh, rolling some product. So, for example, if you are producing a thin foil of aluminium, uh, then the setup looks like this. You have two rollers and this is your product. This could be the aluminium foil. And uh, if you want to produce the correct thickness, you need to have the correct distance between the rollers. So here you see that LVDT can be used to sense the position and uh, you can then control the distance or change the distance uh, between the rollers to, to get the distance that you actually desire. Again, this is typically an environment where you have uh, lots of vibrations, where you have uh, dirt, where you have temperature changes, but uh, uh, 
since the LVDT is a robust sensor, uh, then it's uh, suitable for this kind of applications. Okay, and, uh, uh, and the last sensor for today uh, will be also an inductive sensor, uh, but this time it will be a sensor for angular displacement. You can see that electrically uh, this sensor is very similar to an LVDT. Uh, it is called a resolver uh, and it has also three windings. But in this case, uh, the two windings are placed on a stator. This is an electric machine now. And uh, one winding is placed on the rotor. So this is a typical sensor used uh, in electric machines. So if you have an electric car or if you have an electric train or tram, then most likely there is a resolver inside and that measures the actual position of the rotor. Uh, and uh, the reason why it's there is that uh, in order to control it properly, you need to have info about angular position. So how does it work? Uh, here we have a rotor winding and we supply it with uh, some AC voltage. Again, uh, this is AC powered. Uh, typically the voltage here is few volts with an amplitude and frequency is few kilohertz. So somewhere between uh, 5 to 15 kilohertz approximately. So here we are supplying AC current. This AC current will create an AC magnetic flux around the rotor winding. And we have an AC magnetic flux now. And this AC magnetic flux goes through the stator windings here and here, and it will induce a voltage in the stator winding. So we'll get some voltage here in this stator winding, and we'll get some voltage in this stator winding as well. Now the amplitude of this uh, induced voltage will depend on uh, the alignment. And the alignment is uh, here shown as the angle alpha. So if uh, this angle alpha is uh, changing, we'll get changes uh, in uh, the voltage here and in the voltage there. Now imagine that uh, uh, we will have uh, the rotor winding aligned completely with this uh, top stator winding. So here uh, this rotor winding is aligned in the vertical direction, uh, alpha will be zero. So in this case all the magnetic flux is going only through this stator winding on the top and hence uh, here this V21 will have a maximum magnitude and uh, this bottom stator winding is uh, now aligned in the perpendicular direction like this and uh, theoretically there should be no induced voltage so here this v22 will be zero if now i change the alignment so if i align the rotor like this in the horizontal direction then i will have full voltage here and zero voltage there so uh, there is definitely a dependence between the magnitude of the voltage and uh, the angle alpha. And uh, the angle alpha is uh, what I want to measure, actually. Uh, we can write this uh, mathematically with the formulas. So uh, here, this uh, voltage, this is uh, the power supply voltage to the rotor. It has some magnitude, Vmax, and it has some frequency, so angular frequency omega here. And the stator voltage is the same voltage same frequency times uh, cosine of alpha and uh, in the second uh, winding is again this same part from the rotor times sine alpha so uh, we can see that uh, the both stator voltages uh, are harmonic functions one is a cosine function one is a sine function so now if, if we plot that uh, as a function of alpha uh, we'll see that uh, initially that, well, th this for alpha zero this will have a maximum amplitude uh, and this will have a minimum amplitude. Uh, let's plot that in a, in a chart. Uh, so now this is a plot uh, with uh, angle alpha equal to zero. So here 
uh, the rotor alpha angle is zero so this is completely aligned like that and uh, here uh, showing in green color this is the the winding that we are looking for uh, the the black sign function here that's the rotor voltage that's uh, here the voltage v that we use uh, from the power supply and uh, in general uh, the output voltage here will have a different amplitude but uh, we'll have the phase shift equal to the rotor voltage and uh, we'll have the same frequency so here shown in green uh, this is uh, from this uh, winding and uh, in the ideal case uh, here this second voltage you see will have zero amplitude so uh, here uh, we don't have any voltage at all in this other stator winding. Uh, now if we rotate the resolver by 90 degrees, uh, the windings on the secondary side, they will change rows. So uh, here we see that now the rotor winding is aligned with this winding shown in yellow. And uh, therefore we have the maximum voltage over there and the minimum voltage uh, on the winding shown here in green. So there is definitely a dependence between angle alpha and uh, the amplitude that we have in the windings. Now we can plot this and uh, we'll see this as a function of uh, position. So like this, uh, here we have position on the x-axis from 0 to 360 degrees. And uh, this is the output voltage and uh, one comes from the sine winding. This is uh, the one shown in with the solid curve. And uh, here now shown uh, with this uh, dashed line, uh, it's, that's a cosine winding. So uh, we can see that uh, by using the two voltages, uh, we can actually uh, get the position uh, within one revolution so between 0 and 360 degrees <coughs> so for example uh, if we measure that uh, my sine winding has this voltage and uh, cosine winding has this voltage then i know i know that i am in this position uh, it's not possible to measure just the one voltage uh, again because of the amplitudes so for example if i measure just one amplitude let's say this amplitude then I don't know if I'm at this position or if I'm at this position. So I need the second voltage from the cosine winding. If, if I'm here with the sine voltage, uh, then uh, I have positive voltage and I know I'm at this position. If uh, I have this voltage and that voltage that's negative from the second winding, I know that I'm at this position. So uh, I need both uh, voltages uh, and I need to measure both of them so it's a little bit more complicated electronic circuit it can be embedded uh, into uh, into a chip so you can get uh, something that's called a resolver to digital converter uh, this gives you directly the the info uh, remember that a resolver is an absolute position sensor but only within the range of one revolution that uh, can be visible here from this chart. This chart then repeats if you in are increasing the angle and uh, you cannot distinguish uh, what is uh, the actual position. So uh, it is an absolute sensor only within one revolution. In many applications, this is not a problem at all because uh, we are controlling the, the electric motor, for example, only within one revolution and uh, in, in, the, in the next one it's exactly the same control uh, if you need to control or if you need to measure uh, multiple revolutions then you need to have a counter and uh, then the resolver becomes a relative sensor so it's an absolute within one revolution uh, but a relative sensor within more revolutions uh, typically the resolver is uh, used in applications where uh, you need an absolute encoder such as electric machines and uh, you don't need to have any info about how many revolutions have you actually made. Uh, on the pictures here you have a few examples how a resolver look like. 
so it can look like this uh, this is the stator and this is the rotor and uh, the shaft of your of your machine then goes here it's pressed in into onto the shaft uh, or you can use a coupling so that's the case that you see over there so this is the stator this is the rotor and then you use a flexible coupling to couple the shaft to your machine and to get uh, the info about the position uh, here you can see a little bit inside so again this is the rotor now this is the stator we can see that it has a winding here this is uh, the, the wire in the winding and uh, again there are two secondary windings here on the stator and one on the rotor